It's Bible study time again. <clears throat> Luke chapter 1 is where we're taking back up tonight. Look forward to studying with you. I encourage you to have a Bible open, Luke 1. We'll start reading in verse 26. Uh, we'll backtrack just a couple of verses and kind of uh, look at this section that fits together as a whole there. We've been studying. This is just our third installment of our series uh, in the Gospel of Luke. We did miss uh, last uh, Wednesday and Sunday, so glad to have uh, an opportunity to get back on track together. So appreciate your feedback and, and good comments on this. I hope something, maybe just one thing is shared that you hadn't thought of before, or maybe that you'd forgotten and hadn't had an opportunity to, uh, to remember in a while. So in all these things, we're not looking just at names and places and dates. We're not looking at uh, something we can answer a Bible trivia question or a quiz but rather, how can these things enrich my life? How can these change me to being a better disciple of Christ? And so when you think about the purpose of every part of the Bible, every verse, uh, we trust that God has tucked it in there for a reason. And that uh, if it doesn't seem to have a, an immediate application to me, there's still something principal or a precept that, that might help me. So looking forward to studying with you. Again, Luke 1, let's start reading in verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. I'm going to stop there at verse 28. And so just in these three verses, uh, I might could have done a better job of setting up the context. Prior to this in Luke 1, Gabriel had been sent to speak to Zacharias when he was offering um, during the, in the holy place, during the, the temple. And so he's told him that he and Elizabeth, although they're advanced in age, are going to have a son. They would name him John. And so in the sixth month, this is six months later, we would say, Gabriel's busy again. He's got another mission. And so he's going out to kind of a, uh, not a bustling metropolis, but just kind of out in the middle of nowhere, to a young lady. Uh, we know that she's called a virgin there. She's not just young, but according to Isaiah 7, 14, and that uh, powerful prophecy, uh, she was one who had never known a man. She had not had sexual relations. She's betrothed to, well, we know him to be Joseph, don't we? And that betrothal was a binding thing. It was more than just uh, uh, a counterpart to our modern day uh, engagements. This was so that uh, if you were guilty of sexual unchastity, uh, you could actually be stoned to death just like you would in adultery in a marriage. And another thing is that uh, if, a, if a man who had been betrothed uh, died, the woman would be treated as a widow. So uh, this is a, a strong thing. And so it's very clear that she's pregnant or about to be pregnant, but it's not by Joseph. It's uh, going to be a different birth altogether. And so thinking about how uh, a, a fairly young woman, Mary, and an older woman who is her kinsman, Elizabeth, how they both have unusual birth announcements, pregnancies that uh, are guided by God. Interesting to think about how they're going to shape uh, not just their immediate surroundings, they're going to affect eternity. And we're part of that story. And so we, uh, we can already see uh, a purpose for our thinking about the importance of this. Imagine that you're Mary and you hear this angelic visitor tell you to rejoice. Some versions have the word hail, highly favored one. You're not just favored, you're highly favored. Uh, the Lord is with you. Now, by the way, he's with every one of us. He doesn't favor all of us the same. But it's not the case that any of us could escape his notice, that some would be so low in the totem pole that God would say, you know what, I'm, I'm too busy, I just have no time for them, no interest in them. Uh, but the Lord is with her in a special way. And then even blessed are you among women. Mary would have a task that no one before her, certainly no one after her could fulfill. And so she's told about that. Now I wonder, especially you ladies, imagine trying to uh, to put yourself in her place and imagine the emotions you would feel. Would there be some fear and trepidation? The Bible does say that when she saw him, she was troubled at this or at his saying. Troubled not in the sense, well, I don't, 
I didn't sign up for this. Um, and no thanks, I'll pass. Go on to the next one on the list. But troubled. And she considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Which angels typically had to say to people when they made an appearance. Because uh, that would be something very out of the ordinary of course. He tells, he calls her by her name. I think that's interesting uh, as well. You have found favor with God. You know what? Thinking about our lives and, and the greatest thing that maybe could happen or has happened to us, finding favor with God would rank very high on that list. Now, not that everyone would say that, but isn't that more important? I, I could uh, achieve millions and billions of dollars. I, I could be a president of a CEO or the United States. I could do a number of things, be a world-class athlete or entertainer. But think about that compared to being highly favored or uh, being blessed of God there. You have found favor with God. Sign me up for that. That's the only one that really matters because those other things are all temporary. They have a, uh, a, a time limit confined to this earth, but this one is different, isn't it? Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth the Son and shall call his name Jesus. Now, I want you to think about about three things as I kind of look at them, kind of outline this. Three things said to Mary. Number one, you have found favor uh, with God. That's a good thing. In other words, God did randomly suggest, uh, just pick a lady. It wasn't that he kind of farmed that out to someone else. No, I believe not that he uh, made her right or righteous apart from her, uh, her cooperation. But she found that favor, and God blessed her for that reason there. And so you're going to conceive in your womb and, and bring forth, look at the specification. You're highly favored. You will become pregnant. You will have a son. And so 50-50 chance on that. It could have been a daughter. It could have been twins, either identical or fraternal. But no, it's a singular child that's going to be born. And even the name is given, Jesus. Jehovah is salvation. Jesus will be great. Look at about five things said about this son who is yet to be born. Number one, his name. And he'll be called the son of the highest. That's a powerful thing. That highest referring obviously to God. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. In 2 Samuel seven fourteen, there's an Old Testament passage that clearly is fulfilled here in Jesus. And so, if you think about the status, the situation in Israel at the time, there wasn't a king. There had been a host of kings of Israel and kings of Judah, but after the captivities of Assyria and Babylon, no kings. Not officially, or at least in the sense that we have there. But now, it's the idea that God hasn't reneged on his promise. There's still going to be an occupant on that throne. In fact, it's not a literal one. It's not confined to the city. It's going to be a spiritual throne. And so, this is what your son, <clears throat> although you're unmarried, just betrothed and, and fairly young at the time, this is all going to happen. Uh, and again, imagine her trying to take all this in, to, just to soak it up and think about, wow, could you slow down here a little bit? She's actually going to ask for that in a moment. But I want you to see what else is said about this soon-to-be uh, born son. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever reigning over the house of Jacob. It would be uh, a leadership there. In fact, you, you look at reign and the word kingdom, of his kingdom there will be no end. You realize that's going to be a, a very common word in the Gospels, especially in this Gospel here of Luke. Luke 1 is going to use that word kingdom. And talking about the reign of his father, literally his forefather, Jacob. I want you to think about the time frame and the expiration of that, it's forever. You know, that helps us understand this could not have been a, a literal earthly ruler. If he's doing that forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end, then he is a spiritual king and, and doesn't have a successor, doesn't have someone following him or, uh, or that he's handing the reins over to. All right, now, Mary's been told a lot. And so she says to the angel, verse 34 of Luke 1, How can this be since I do not know a man? I can almost hear her saying, wait, wait, wait. 
So I'm, I'm going to get pregnant and I'm going to have a son and, and this is going to be his nature and his name and his quality. Wait a minute. The issue is I haven't known a man. I haven't had sexual relations with anyone. And here's the interesting thing how that Gabriel assures her this is going to be a different pregnancy. And this will fulfill passages maybe that she didn't know that well or hadn't thought about in, in the way that she was going to fulfill them. Luke one thirty five. the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. That overshadowing may have some overtones of of the, the spirit hovering over the water there in Genesis, the first couple of verses. It may be the idea, even the image of God uh, in, in the, the fire and the cloud as he's leading Israel through the wilderness wanderings, God overshadowing, God looming there. And so the Holy Spirit, not a human, not Joseph specifically, is going to be behind the pregnancy here of uh, Mary on this occasion. That Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. I love that already Jesus is called that Holy One. The word holy means set apart. It means sanctified. You could look at the word consecrated as a homonym there. And so understand that Jesus, in an absolute sense, is holy. I can be holy. I, I'm needing to be holy. Consecrated and set apart, but not sinless, not flaw, uh, flawless in regard to, to my moral purity, but Jesus certainly was. That's kind of hinted at already here. He will be called the Son of God. Jesus didn't use that term incidentally that often for himself. Now, he did on occasion, but uh, his his common designation was Son of Man. That's not a the idea that there's a contradiction or that he's either one or the other. He actually was both. But Jesus certainly emphasized his his humanity, that sense in which he, he could identify with and relate to people throughout his ministry. And so uh, Mary is told, don't worry about the pregnancy. God's taking care of that. The Holy Spirit will be the agency. Now watch this next surprise for her. Verse 36. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, your Bible there may say kinsman or something, may say cousin, I don't know that we could establish they were first cousins or second cousins, but uh, at least kind of a, a general relative. Elizabeth has conceived a son in her old age, and now is the sixth month for her who was called barren. I think that word, pardon the pun, is pregnant with meaning her who was called barren. The Bible is a book of overcoming. It is a book of change and transformation. And so Thinking about how that this woman who kind of her tagline, uh, the byword associated with Elizabeth for most of her life was barren. But now she was formerly that because God intervened and opened up her womb and allowed even uh, Zacharias to impregnate her. And so I love that the one who was called barren. Think about changes in people, some that I've witnessed, some that I read about and how God blesses people and is using people who formerly stole and lied and murdered and aborted a baby and all kinds of remarkable things. They, they swindled and, and all these things, and, and yet God forgave them. And God has restored them and given them a purpose they perhaps could not have dreamed of. You might underline this verse in your Bible. It's Luke 1, 37, for with God nothing will be impossible. There's the hint in the Greek that maybe the, the specific idea is for with God, no words will be impossible or nothing that's recorded will be impossible. And that's not confining that just to words, certainly actions as well. And throughout the Bible, there is that, that refrain of God being the God of the possible and how that nothing is too hard for him. I was told to uh, Abram and Sarah back uh, in the book of Genesis as they also face barrenness. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Do you believe that? Is your life living up to, uh, to that understanding and, and that uh, mental, uh, mental anchor that we can put down there? And so Mary, this kind of closes this section. Mary said, 
This is in response or in reply to Gabriel. Behold the maid servant of the Lord. She's talking about herself there. I, and, and this, if you attached a word, if you're trying to think of a concept of what is she trying to say, I would say this. She is saying, I humbly accept the mission. Her humility is a wonderful trademark. Behold the maid servant of the Lord. She's not saying I'm going to be queen. She's not in her mind exalting herself, elevating herself. No, I am a, a gentle maid servant of God. Let it be to me according to your word. Let everything you've said transpire and take place. And the angel departed from her. Now what's interesting is you you flip over to Matthew's account in Matthew 1 and how Gabriel talks to Joseph and tells her not tells him not to be afraid to take her Mary as wife because the Holy Spirit uh, had uh, had inspired had inspired her had impregnated her and uh, so evidently Mary didn't tell Joseph about this encounter. What is interesting then is how the God is using both of them. It's going to be in chapter 3 of Luke's account when you find the genealogy. There's a lot of details given about John the Baptist and his birth, about the birth of Jesus, but there will also be, for our comparison to Matthew 1, that, uh, that genealogical account. I'll save some remarks about that until then. And so thinking about this watershed moment for Barry, I have been selected by the God of heaven to bear the Son of God. Her concept of the Messiah, probably a lot less defined than ours, incidentally, but, but everything said to her was amazing. God is going to bring about through me. And, you know, God uses people that way. She wasn't probably uh, that most, uh, that notable no one's necessarily pointing fingers and saying, that Mary right there, I tell you what, she's going to bear the Son of God. And yet, in her righteousness, God uses people. God can use me and you. Not for purposes like this, I'm not saying that, but God can use us to accomplish amazing things. Natural people under the influence of a supernatural God. That needs to be my mindset throughout all of this. Let's look at this visit from Mary to Elizabeth. Luke one thirty nine. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. I'll stop right there in verse 42. And so six months after Elizabeth conceives, Gabriel speaks to Mary. Mary naturally wants to see her. And so this conversation, we have a little of it contained here. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall and heard what else they talked about. I wonder if they got their Old Testaments out and were pouring over those passages and wondering what God was doing and kind of uh, theorizing about how it was all going to take place. We don't know how well these two knew each other, uh, Mary and Elizabeth, but again, they are relatives. Maybe there were family reunions. Perhaps they would go to Jerusalem together on the great feast days, and uh, they would kind of hang out in their family group. And so when she greets her, this is going to be very symbolic. This is a weighty thing. The babe leaped in her womb. Now, some of you ladies that have been pregnant, have brought children in the world, you know in that sixth month is pretty common, pretty customary to, to have movement. Sometimes, especially with the first, there's this, hey, hey honey, come over, or, or uh, kids, or everyone, come look at my stomach. This, this baby's on, on caffeine or something, and so uh, just going wild in there, but this is going to be not just a normal, it's going to be an abnormal, but really a super normal thing that's taking place. When John the Baptist, still in the womb, hears the voice of Mary, he leaped in her womb. And at that moment, Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, what do you make of that? Do you think she always, from that point on, was filled with the Holy Spirit? Or did she temporarily speak these words? I tend to think it was a temporary thing, but very clearly. 
she is saying something she would not have known otherwise. In other words, Mary didn't write her a letter, or send her an email or a text and say, hey, I'm pregnant. Uh, when I get there, I'll tell you about it. So Elizabeth perhaps knew that she was only betrothed, not officially married. And yet she says, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Some of the commentators weigh in and say, well, perhaps Mary was already pregnant by this time. It's not that she's just going to be, but she is. And then watch the rest of what uh, Elizabeth says. Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? She's speaking by inspiration. This is the Holy Spirit calling Mary younger now than Elizabeth, the mother of my Lord. How can you have a Lord younger than you that hasn't even been born yet? And so Jesus is going to be that Lord in the spiritual sense. He's going to be the Savior, literally, of everyone in their household and every other household as well. I want to say a word here. Luke 1 isn't contained or recorded in the Bible to help give us an argument against abortion. But you know what? What a powerful thing it is when you read here that the babe leaped in her womb or leapt in her womb. A word in the Greek is the word brephos. What does it mean? A wings baby. That word is used for a baby who has been born. And, and consistently, it's also used for a woman who has a baby in her belly, as we would tell our little kids. In other words, if you're looking for justification from the Bible for abortion, you don't find it at all. In fact, you find just the opposite. Here's life. Here's treasured life. God had a purpose for John the Baptist when he is still prenatal. God had a purpose for his own son as he's in development those nine months. And so if Mary, and, and this is just a, a ghastly thought, I think, to any of us, if Mary decided, you know what, it's not a good time, I'm young and, and not officially married, you know what, I'm just going to terminate this pregnancy. The world today would say, go ahead, sure. How would that go with God? And so I understand it's the Son of God, but can't imagine that uh, there would be any excuse for her, even if it had been a natural birth, for her to do that very thing. And so while these verses, again, I'm not saying that uh, they're, they're tucked in there for us to counter abortion rights advocates, very clearly we can see that uh, life is precious and it begins in the womb. It's not uh, this idea that personhood arrives from the moment they emerge from the womb. No, there's, uh, there's an identity that's already taking place there. That is at least secondarily emphasized throughout these passages here. I want you to think about Elizabeth for a second. Let me share a quote from a, a commentator by the name of Gelden Hughes, if I'm saying that right. Elizabeth nobly and voluntarily placed herself in the background and acknowledged unreservedly, uh, unreservedly and joyfully that her younger relative had received infinitely more honor than she. Skipping down a little later, he says, whilst jealousy would have darkened her life, her humble attitude opened for her the gates to true, deep, and jubilant joy. He who elevates himself is constantly engaged in wrecking his own life, but he who is sincerely humble finds richness of life and happiness. That's a, just another way of saying, no wonder God picked even Elizabeth to bring John the Baptist in the world because she wasn't jealous. She uh, is not uh, throwing a pity party because she's not the one bearing the Messiah. She's all too happy to be uh, an instrument in the hand of God and to do whatever it is that his will is. And so uh, it's amazing to me, as soon as the voice of your greeting, she says in Luke 1, sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed. She's talking about Mary here. Blessed are you because you trust, in other words, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. And again, Elizabeth didn't know what all that was. This helped to confirm, obviously, to Mary something very unusual is going on here. And again, I, I would love to think about how that for nearly three months, you can piece that together in just a moment, um, you, you read about uh, uh, Mary remaining. This is in Luke 156. We'll get there beyond uh, tonight, obviously. 
Mary remained with her about three months. There's that kind of general time frame and returned to her house and Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered and she brought forth the son. So nearly, nearly three months they're visiting, they're talking, laughing, dreaming, praying perhaps. How amazing uh, that would have been. I want to start with what's called uh, the, the Magnificat. Magnificat, there's a song we sing it sometimes in worship. Maybe you've heard it in other places as well. It comes from the word in the Latin that's actually the first word here in Luke uh, 146, my soul magnifies. You see the word magnificat and magnify. My soul magnifies the Lord. And so we've got an angel talking to Zacharias, angel talking to Mary, uh, Elizabeth speaking by the influence of the Holy Spirit, and now the song of Mary. My soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. In all things, God is to be praised. In all things, God causes joy. She calls God her Savior while she knows that she is bearing one, Jesus, who is going to work with God as the second member of the Godhead to effect salvation for all of us. I think it's interesting to underscore here that her son would also save her. That song, Mary, Did You Know, often sung at the holidays, uh, that powerful principles brought forth uh, even in those lyrics there. She says in verse 48, he, that is God, has regarded the lowly state of his maid servant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. The lowly state, she marvels, God, you're using a nobody to do this. And I think she is right in the idea that all generations continue to call her blessed. And we call her blessed because God did. There's a, a tendency in some religious circles, my opinion, to overemphasize Mary, to put her up on a pedestal that not even God desired for her. There were some, some odd doctrines, some unbiblical things taught about her. She's never... Uh, called a mediatrix. She's not a, a co-mediator with Jesus for our sins. Uh, they, they talk about uh, the Immaculate Conception, uh, that, that somehow you know, Mary was perfect. Not only was Jesus, but Mary was. Uh, the perpetual virginity, the Bible talks about her having children after Jesus. And so a lot of things, praying to Mary was never done in the New Testament, shouldn't be done today. And so how some of these things cropped up, I have no idea. And so it's a matter of not just saying, oh, you know, any old girl would have done, but it's not a matter of us having to uh, take that principle from Luke 148, all generations call me blessed. We're not calling her a co-savior or uh, elevating her again to a position God never designed for her. Here's what she says in Luke 149, for he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. This is just a beautiful song and praise. His mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. If you were to take what is said here in this song, compare it to many of the Old Testament passages, go back to the Psalms, you'll see a beautiful dovetailing of, of so many of those concepts and even those words there. He has shown strength with his arm. Verse 51, he scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. You could trace stories in the Old Testament of God doing that. We had one of those today in, in Isaiah, some of those middle chapters in the 30s and 40s of uh, Sennacherib and the death of 185,000 Assyrians there on that occasion. Verse 52, he's put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. God is a God who can kind of turn topsy-turvy some of the, uh, uh, just the, the ways of men and, and what we uh, esteem as, as highly regarded. It says in verse 53, the gods filled the hungry with good things and the rich he sent away empty. And that's not saying that rich people are bad per se, but I think it's in this context, the rich who are self-satisfied that way. And we'll close with verses 40, uh, 54 through 56. He has helped his servant Israel. I like that. Israel is compared as a nation to a servant. It's kind of like the whole is now uh, compressed into a part in remembrance of his mercy. 
God is the ultimate helper. And God had in mind, even before eternity, to send the Savior to change things up. Uh, alteration in the covenants, obviously, that had not been anticipated by many. Verse 55, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. She's tying in the idea that this is not something that God's forgotten what he promised Abraham or Moses or David. No, this is is pulling it all together, all those ancient promises and the modern ones as well. And Mary remained, the Bible here says, with her about three months and returned to her house. So she didn't say, stay to see John the Baptist born. And so she's three months into her pregnancy when that happens. And you wonder, I guess as we close, whether there was any dealings from that moment on with these, how much longer uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth uh, live. We'll get into that some, Lord willing, this coming Sunday night. I want to thank you for studying with us in Luke 1. Uh, mark in your Bible, Luke 1, 57. Study on ahead, be looking at that. Get some good study helps maybe and some commentaries to uh, help you to, to be prepared for this study. Look forward to having you with us. Can't wait to study with you again. God bless you. Remember prayer time coming up at uh, 8 o'clock. That's back on tap this week as well. We'll talk to you soon. God bless.